So again, here's the question. How do they bridge that gap? What are, what's the oversummering activity? To me, that's an important question in the long-term management of this PIPs. I want to go from there real quickly to damage potential. And I think most of you growers and PCAs in the field have a somewhat of a good sense of what the damage potential of this pest is just based on your, your own experiences. Uh, we have a good sense of the feeding symptomology. Uh, some of it's classic stink bug uh, feeding activity, as well as some of the what I call the gross plant responses. What, what does the plant look like at the end of the season? There's some questions here that really um, I have, particularly seedling mortality, because a lot of things happen in August or September with high humidity and high temperatures and plants that are trying to germinate when uh, you've got the grotto as well as other things going on, and then some of the other things. So I'm going to kind of take you through this real quick. Um, based on the literature and the way most feed bugs feed, it's, a, it's called the last rate and flush method of feeding. Basically what they do is they, 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 uh, they inject their, their, they have mandibles, if you will. That's these little, this little sword-shaped apparatus right there, feeding apparatus. Within that are, are straw-like mandibles, or uh, stylus, if you will, that actually remove plant juices from the, from the uh, plant tissue. They do inject a, a salivary enzyme to help break that down, and that's part of the damage. I want to show you a little video. I haven't tried this before, so we're going to see if we can get away with this. If you watch this video, you see that thing thrusting up and down? It's actually trying to thrust. If you freeze it, that's its mandibles. It's got that stuck right into the plant tissue. The mandibular part of it, those little uh, straw parts, if you will, or, or straws, are actually moving underneath the surface, destroying cell tissue and removing plant juices. If you keep going, you can see, you can see it again. That, that adult was sitting there going, kind of like going like this, and it's, it's shoving that mandibles, mandibles, or stylus underneath there, and it's just, that's the smell part, it's just stuck there. And the reason I want to show you that is because you can just see them moving up and down. That's basically what they're doing. And that's how you get this resulting feeding damage on these leaves. These star-shaped lesions, a lot of people call them tattoos or scorches, those little star-shaped lesions that you all oftentimes see on the leaf tissue, that's a result of that, that thrusting action where that, that mouth part comes up and goes in, constantly kind of moving around, even though that mouth part is just stuck right on top of that leaf. But nonetheless, that, that's what we see in terms of this, this uh, scorching. Now, in terms of the actual feeding, this is some time-lapse photography we just started to play with. This is a, uh, a, a fresh little cotyledon that just emerged. This is in the laboratory under, under laboratory conditions. We placed a single adult on that leaf, just like that, for, for two days. This is what it looked like two days after we left that adult. Now, of course, he went on and off the plant and moved around. But you can see those symptoms that you, we described just on that. By day four, you can see that leaf is starting to wilt down pretty good. This was two days ago. I went this morning before I came to the meeting and looked at the, the plant. It was just about dead. And that's, that's, you know, a lot of that's already done. He's not even feeding on that anymore. It's just, it's just starting to wilt down and die. And if you go into the field, you see the same kind of response. You saw, you saw a lot of this on, on stuff in September, early September. And this is three days post-emergence, um, after the plants emerged. Um, you can see that kind of damage out there. And depending on the numbers, will depend on, oftentimes, what kind of damage you see. The other thing you don't necessarily see in this photo or the previous, is the apical meristem, or the growing point, the terminal, the ultimate terminal. 10 to 1, that thing is damaged. It's been fed on, as well as the mesophyll tissue on the cotyledon itself, you'll see feeding on that, that meristem. And of course, what that results in are two different things. It either completely knocks out the, the, um, the apical dominance of the plant, and you end up with, like on broccoli, a blind plant. And I haven't seen too many blind plants except for the last couple of years. Um, unless a cricket or something had chewed it out. But lately I've been seeing quite a few of these. The other thing that often occurs once you have an insect feeding on that terminal, if it doesn't knock it out, you'll get this um, advantageous bud break, they call it, where you get multiple terminals being produced. You can see one, two, three, four, five. And ultimately, when you get towards the end of the year, it starts to look like this. We start seeing a lot of plants after our, our September 1 wet date plots this year, 
when we went to harvest, a lot of them look like this. I guess if, this isn't a bad deal if you want to get two hits for the price of one, if it's got some quality to it. Chances are it probably didn't have some quality. However, then you get a lot of this. The problem with this is, is that when you're trying to make that main hit, all this other energy is being diverted to these secondary terminals. Or, in a case like this, where you get all this other advantageous growth, and it just never grows normally. And this is something that we've seen the last two years, particularly in broccoli. Now certainly, transplants are a little bit different because they've already got an established plant. They've already got established terminals. And they're planting in there, but of course the plant's under stress. It's been stressed down, and generally it's under stress when it's placed in the field. And you'll get adults feeding on that leaf, and sometimes they'll actually feed again on that apical terminal. Even though it's very, very small at that point, you'll end up with, again, blind plants, which is, is never good. And in some cases, you'll see this, that advantageous growth. This is pretty rare. I don't see a lot of this, but you will see this when you've got plots that are heavily infested with bagrana. But again, not near the extent that you see it in cabbage. Cabbage is interesting. This is direct seeded cabbage. <coughs> You'll see that same knocking out of the, the terminal bud. Uh, but you also see a lot of this, particularly with the transplants that I've experienced, the multiple heads, that when you start trimming stuff back, instead of having just the, same, the, the single head being produced, you've got energy and it's splitting and advantageous. And certainly when you compare it to what a plant should look like, it's just, it's not productive. It's not productive at all. So you may be asking yourself about this time, well, Plumbo, how do you actually know that this is Pagrata bud? Well, we don't exactly love anecdotal evidence, but we've done some trial work as well. We did a study last year to, answer, to ask that exact question, and that was, what's the impact of this bug feeding on uh, the ultimate yield of a plant? We set up trials where we had row covers actually placed over lines of uh, cauliflower transplants and cabbage transplants. Then we had plots that were, we didn't do anything for them. No, no insecticides, anything, an untreated check. And then we had a very aggressive insecticide program where we put soil insecticides down, did a culprit, came over the top weekly with, with foliar sprays. We pulled, these, we pulled these covers off at 20 days. So basically, the row cover treatments were protected for 20 days without any bugs. These, in theory, were as well because they were insecticide uh, treated. And we counted the numbers. The numbers pretty much show us that. Of course, the untreated were loaded. This is just uh, 25 days after row cover, or basically 45 days after wet date. And you can already see that check plot down there. There's a stunted, stunted growth. Just the impact of the feeding alone had an impact with the kind of numbers we had relative to the treated or the, the row cover. Now I want to kind of show you some data. This is the yield results for cauliflower. We made some measurements in terms of the number of blind plants. Treated and row cover really not any difference, but you'll still see that we still saw about five to six percent of the plants were blind. And I don't know if that's normal or not, but the untreated by itself was almost 25. Almost a quarter of the plants in that block were blind. What's interesting though is that we didn't see much multi-terminal. It really wasn't any difference. Statistically, no differences in the number of multi-terminals. And even in, in terms of yield, now we did a single harvest, just a one pass through. Uh, looking at mature heads, marketable sized heads, and there was a, a, a significant yield reduction, um, but it see, almost seemed like those untreated plants tended to recover a little bit because we didn't see a lot of this. It did seem to set them back a little bit. Um, <coughs> and I would say at this point that in the cauliflower, you do get blind plants, but you also see a delay in maturity. Cabbage is a different story though. With cabbage, uh, again, we still saw 20% of the plants were blind, but almost 80% of them had the multiple terminals where they'd been stung. And even in the row cover, where we kept them protected for 20 days, we still saw 20% of the plants had multiple terminals. So again, even after you've kept them protected for a small time, they've got a little size, they're starting to grow out of their shock, they're still susceptible to the, uh, to the bug. Well, would 30 days or something like that have mattered? I mean, they go a little bit... That's a good question. I don't know. That's that's one of the questions we want to find out. And did you spray after you pulled the roll cover? We did. We did. So basically, we tried to narrow it down to that first 20 days. Uh, we still had a few bugs in there even after we started treating. Bottom line, 80 percent, pretty good yields where we had to treat it and untreat it. Significant yeah. yield reductions, largely account to that multiple terminals going down. So again, this bug has some can have significant <coughs> impacts with the kind of numbers that we saw. 
But really, that's the magic question. And I know we talked about this a lot, is that, okay, I know this, these bugs will kill my stand, they'll do significant damage to stand establishment. When do I quit, when, do, when can I stop spraying? What, at what stage, four leaf stage, six leaf stage, eight leaf stage, when is that plant beyond the point of susceptibility? And I don't know. And that's one of the things I don't think we know. That's a stage specific injury, we need to figure that out. And how many bugs <coughs> do I need to worry about? One per 30 feet? One per plant, one per 50 plants. Again, thresholds we're talking now. When do we stop spraying? When do we need to spray? Again, those questions uh, we really don't have an answer for right now. But again, this is one of the second areas that uh, research needs to be focused into. You know, at least that's what we're going to focus on. And then finally, I want to conclude with IPM and control. Um, and I just would make this, these two blanket statements. Based on what I saw, based on talking with you guys, Contact insecticides work. They will knock them down. You get very good knockdown with contact insecticides. Residual, it's hard to say. We don't really know. Particularly when you've got sprinklers and you're trying to come in uh, at stand establishment and you've got other factors to play. I will say this based on my experience, and again, talking to guys that grow organic, biorationals aren't very effective. In a sense, they really don't work. The, uh, the products that are used in organic are not very effective. At least the ones I've seen. Some other questions, what about foliar soil neonicotinoids? Again, the question here has always been, they've got to feed on the plant to get an active dose. They've got to actually ingest the product to be toxic. Are they causing damage in the process of coming in contact with the toxicant? Good question, and then chemigation. I'm just gonna real quickly take you through some of my experiences and what I think. 